Good evening, folks. Uh, I want to welcome you here to a master class where we're going to discuss uh, building with artificial atoms. Uh, my name is Christopher Murray, or Chris Murray, and uh, I'm looking forward to a, a chance to share some of the work that we're excited about and also uh, uh, hopefully some stimulating discussions. Um, the, uh, the research that I'm going to talk about and some of the tutorial themes that I'll bring out are actually works that are done in my group uh, at uh, the University of Pennsylvania in partnership with uh, Sherry Kagan and her team also at the University of Pennsylvania. And so what you'll see is that there's sort of a, a seamless, or we try to make it seamless, but an integration between the design of different types of, of component systems uh, and the efforts to understand their properties, integrate them, and ultimately to begin building uh, devices and circuits in this work. And so I'm a member of the faculty in chemistry and in material science at the University of Pennsylvania. And my uh, group, uh, uh, strives to try to use materials chemistry techniques, but um, take the perspective of a uh, materials engineer in terms of optimization and integration of, of the systems. What I'm going to tell you about um, in uh, the lecture is a series of, of, of discussions of sort of um, kind of state of the art building blocks at the nanoscale that we will represent as, as uh, proposed substi uh, 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 substitutes for what we think of as uh, standard atomic and molecular building blocks. Those systems are, when uh, uh, engineered properly, um, uh, systems that show a combination of quantum mechanical and finite size effects, but also have the potential to couple and interact with their neighbors to produce new classes of, of delocalized uh, properties. And so what we'll do throughout uh, this evening's discussion is to think about the development of inorganic um, particles that have a core that is a crystalline material, tunable electronic optical, um, in, in, in a few examples towards the end, maybe uh, magnetic behavior, but with uh, an organic uh, uh, coating that helps with their processability and their synthesis, but then the ability to exchange that uh, interface layer to allow the communication and interaction between the systems. We'll use solution phase syntheses. In particular, a term that we use is solvothermal th synthesis, which means solution phase colloidal synthesis at uh, high temperature. And it also is generally used to describe systems that are um, done under non-aqueous conditions. So it's sort of a sister technique to what is also uh, would be referred to as high temperature aqueous synthesis or hydrothermal uh, uh, synthesis in this piece. We'll um, follow that path to try to realize some of the examples in the development of, of field effect transistors and ultimately taking those also into um, some circuits and other model systems. And the progression of today's, uh, this evening's discussion will, uh, if, if successful, go from um, design of size and shape controlled uh, uh, building blocks through the development of strategies to control their coupling so that new properties emerge from that interaction. We'll try to set a framework where we begin to think about doping and, and modification of those building block properties. And then in the final section of our discussion, we will um, have some fun as we think about how we combine different types of building blocks into new multi-component architectures. And hopefully in that journey, we'll have a chance to um, uh, see uh, the chemical sciences or chemical design of materials as embracing more than the atomic and molecular building blocks, but really kind of reaching up in length scales to mesoscopic length scales where the, uh, the particles now become uh, components that capture a little bit of the best of the world of molecules with discrete tunable electronic properties and the macroscopic world where we think about uh, components that have better developed extended um, uh, uh, and delocalized uh, energy properties. So um, um, this is a process of controlled uh, nucleation and growth that we uh, take advantage of for uh, most of the systems that I'll discuss today. There is generally a, an initial growth phase that is triggered either by a ramp in temperature or a uh, spike in the concentration in the uh, solution. And that's followed by a period of growth that occurs below the nucleation threshold for new particles within that solution. And that's really important. If you have those conditions, 
you have set up a uh, um, set of, of uh, or a growth environment that can lead to a narrowing of the size distribution as the, uh, as the system proceeds. Um, in some cases, OSFAL ripening, which is a process of, of, of materials transfer from the smallest particles to the larger in the group, helps to sort of nudge this along in its growth. But a number of mechanisms can be important in this, uh, in this piece. I mentioned about the <coughs> scale-up. So a research lab experiment you know, in the early 1990s was to try to understand more about the um, the evolution of electronic properties is a function of size. And so what this particular image represents is sort of that thought experiment. It is, it's, it is real data, but going from just groupings of a few hundred atoms up to 10, 000, uh, tens of thousands of atoms. And the, the spectra that you see here represent steps of approximately one atomic layer added in solution by the growth process that, that allows these particles to grow. And so that um, uh, sort of uh, opportunity to add, uh, you know, grow at a rate that allows you to extract and isolate things that are just, you know, plus or minus one, uh, one layer of atoms or, or certainly at least in that range of, of one uh, um, lattice constant was a real game changer for us in terms of what we could then think about in, term, in changing their properties. But this was done at a very... Uh, small scale, and actually I'll, I'll confess one piece, which it still bothers me to this day, actually. So <coughs> in my current life, I actually teach courses on materials chemistry, different disciplines, but one that I love is, is uh, chemistry that is focused on um, uh, environmental and, uh, sorry, energy and environmental sustainability. So basically taking a materials chemist approach to understand how new technologies are um, thought from uh, sort of a full life cycle point of view. This is a terrible example because when I was a student, we were working with cadmium uh, heavy metal based materials. It was a model system. We thought only about the uh, value of those systems for understanding basic physics and the spectroscopy that, that could be uh, better understood using these kinds of things. We never honestly imagined that anyone would want to make tons of the stuff. Right? <coughs> the reason that that's an issue is that the community, we contributed to this, but a much larger community, then found these systems useful and they began to improve in their properties in a way that made it difficult to take another path, to choose a, a greener material to eliminate those uh, heavy metal materials. That's happening now and it's forced by the fact that there's consumer issues in terms of how we take this up, but a life lesson is that I actually t now take with much of the other work that I'm doing is that we think about making substitutions in terms of those acceptance issues earlier in the scientific process. The most important thing is to make it work. But as soon as you have a, a, a thought that your work may actually go beyond your lab and begin to expand, I really also should have been helping with this, but to begin removing some of the heavy metal components and other things that are um, potentially safety issues later on. So a lot of momentum in the system, great tunability, good optical properties, and so it becomes the first that gets uh, in, uh, uh, commercialized at large scale. The images that I have here are a couple different designs for new uh, generation uh, monitors and, uh, and televisions that are based on different form factors for the incorporation of this type of quantum dot system. There are a number of industry leaders in this space, um, Samsung, Nanosys, others that sell components, some that are full manufacturers. Um, but this uh, type of process now means that, the <laughs> and this is my view of scale up, but, uh, you know, if I was really uh, thinking about uh, this transition. So chemical engineers, a lot of smart people figured out how to do this transition. It's not, it's not the work that we were doing 25 years ago that really enabled the critical steps for this piece. But um, it is humbling when you go into a plant site and you see reactors that are running at 800 liters a row putting out tons of this material, right? You've transitioned to a point where it's actually the basis of a billion dollar value add to uh, a, an important technology. And 
in this case, it's, it's the, uh, the tunability, color fidelity, quantum yield that allows you to have better performance in, in that generation of, of television. So I don't know what, that, in the United States, it would be Best Buy or someplace you would go out. But you know, th th this is a science talk. But if you want to, you can go out and put one of these things in your apartment and hopefully enjoy some improved energy efficiency as well as, as better uh, color quantity. So, what I want to give you a window on is if this is sort of the generation of compact spherical particles with, uh, with some inorganic functionalization on the surface, but basically what is commercialized here represents what was cutting edge science 10 or 15 years ago and then had to be really worked through in every detail to improve all of the lifetime issues and reliability and so on. I want to give you a view of what comes next in terms of of uh, materials that might flow into that. I'm not going to talk so much about purification and separation, although I would m just mention that these are aspects that are extremely important throughout this whole area of research. Um, the ability to uh, develop methods that you can um, use as a way of quality control in, in uh, uh, allowing not only reproducibility, but basically to have a system where you actually specify certain tolerances in the performance of the material is a critical step. It's not emphasized at the stage of graduate students and, and sort of your early stage careers, but it becomes extremely important as you try to transition that, uh, that any technology that you're interested in out into the real world. So the kinds of systems that we were playing with at that time were only had quantum yields at around 20%. They have absorption spectrum that we saw before. This is blown up a little more, and a fluorescence peak that um, allows that um, operation in an emissive mode. This came from systems that were fairly uniform, standard deviation in size around 5%. And they represented uh, this uh, tunable inorganic core and some type of insulating spacer. So these systems lived in a world where each particle really didn't see very much of its neighbor or interact significantly in, um, in a way that would modify the properties. A lot of what I'm going to tell you in the next few minutes is about how we change that paradigm and start to think about coupling these systems more, uh, more effectively. I mean, there's a little bit um, uh, more of a blow up. You can see the uh, internal structure and a little bit of the uh, sort of modulation. That's the, the lattice. I apologize. This is not the best uh, projection um, format for, uh, for high resolution. But um, these are, are artificial atoms. In, uh, and the idea that, that I'll keep coming back to is that if you step back for a second and think about how we visualize the world of atomic systems with some uncertainty in you know, electron uh, density uh, in orbitals and a little bit of, of our, we're going to try to think about what quantum mechanically describes the occupation of, of electrons in, in one region versus a neighboring region coupling, exchange constants, those sort of things. We want to try and translate those ideas about chemistry, but now to systems that are um, in units of hundreds of atoms, thousands of atoms, or tens of thousands of atoms. All right. The um, surface chemistry will also be important. That's not something I'm going to talk about too much today. But the idea that you would take those inorganic cores and then be able to put a variety of different um, organic functionalizations, or ultimately some inorganic functionalizations, will be important to develop a tool set that allows us to make these materials compatible with uh, different types of dispersing environments and also to change the degree of coupling uh, between those. All right. Um, I have an image here which shows some of the uh, uh, other family of materials that I'll use throughout my talk but it parallels the discussion of the cadmium selenide example that I, I uh, mentioned before. These are uh, in the family of lead chalcogenides, and there's a much larger family now of, of uh, systems that are made in, I think most predominantly in the family of chalcogenides, but the, uh, the, there is um, uh, important progress in the area of three fives and other types of semiconducting materials. But this tunability now that we follow uh, cuts through a large swath of the near-infrared into um, ultimately some features that start going out closer to where we might uh, refer to it as mid-infrared. So um, 
the, n these are not uh, outside of the range of visible technologies, but very much in uh, an area where thermal technology sensors and, and other um, uh, device functions can benefit from uh, the low band gap and actually often high mobilities that come with these materials. So what do we have to do to get these systems to start talking to each other? Um, we need to think about creating new solids that are, are not a traditional semiconductor um, material, but now composed of these individual quantum dots coupled to each other, and then develop means of patterning and, and integration. And to do that, we have to be able to control the, um, the size and, and therefore the energy distribution between the neighboring sites. We need to be able to adjust the surface composition and overall stoichiometry of the components so that each particle is as uniform and, uh, and similar to its neighbors as possible. And I'll say actually you know, one piece here which, uh, well, we'll come back to this a little bit, but uh, doping is very important. So um, it's, it's uh, critical in this area that we not only be able to produce materials with the uh, compositions and structures that we want, but we also need to be able to tweak their properties by small additions of other components that will uh, allow us to activate electronic properties that, that we need. If you asked an electrical engineer that, uh, to give up all of the great tool set that they developed for modern microelectronics uh, to have this quantum confinement and this, all these new things, but told them they had to give up doping, in order to be able to uh, take advantage of that, they would walk away instantly because doping and modulation of composition over a sort of continuous range of uh, properties is, is essential in the design of modern electronics. Quantum mechanical phenomena like quantum confinement and some of the resonance phenomena we'll talk about is a wonderful add-on on top of those properties, but it really, needs to be synergistic as opposed to uh, something that's, that's orthogonal to those. So early efforts in this were uh, underway now uh, 10 years ago, maybe a little more, but where we started to think about removing uh, some of uh, the organic surfactants that are used in the synthesis and begin replacing those with more compact species. This happens to be an example where a small molecule hydrazine was used to um, um, uh, strip off the bulky organics and provide more coupling. Um, that's another example of when I hadn't learned about green chemistry yet. So hydrazine is also rocket fuel. So using it at large scale is not very uh, popular in an industrial setting. It's also toxic. Um, what else is it? It uh, reacts with water, so it's somewhat unstable. Anyway, every, everything that's on my checklist of what I tell my students to be concerned about now uh, I, I was not paying attention to. But what it did allow us to do was to take some of these very uniform uh, particles, begin to couple them close enough in space, and, uh, and also allow um, 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 the electronic density of the quantum confined wave functions to begin to overlap between neighboring particles. There are a couple of other things that help here in terms of high dielectric constant, which uh, reduces the amount of, of um, Coulomb penalty, charging energy, that the materials um, uh, have to pay as charges move through those systems. But as we go through these, the matching of energy alpha, the overlap between the wave functions beta, and this EC, Coulomb charging energy, if we can optimize these, we can get to a state where we begin to get um, delocalized electronic behavior that looks a lot like a traditional semiconductor material. And so, this doesn't look like a very good one necessarily. This has mobility of around one, which means it's comparable to amorphous silicon. But at the time in this area, the highest reported mobilities were 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus four. And so the ability to sort of take some of these systems and put them head to head with a, um, a real world inorganic uh, uh, semiconducting competitor was a, an important step. All right. so, as we think about these, and for electrical engineers and for others who work in the area of electronics, these curves are more familiar for chemists and folks that uh, haven't seen these before. So this is current versus voltage. 
And essentially what we're seeing is the turn on of a, a, a uh, transistor in which the nanocrystal materials are serving as the channel in the device. Okay? And the only things to take away from this is that it's a relatively well-behaved material in terms of its characteristics. The uh, figure of merit that I mentioned before um, about the mobility is in this generation, say 10 years ago, was around one. And so that's just the edge where um, uh, phys uh, communities and physical models sort of overlap. So at mobilities below one, people generally refer to hopping or site-to-site -site, um, uh, movement of charge in discrete steps, generally thermally activated steps, as being the most appropriate way to describe the electronic movement of, of charge in a material. If you move a little bit above one, then in mobility, that means that the scattering is not happening at every jump, but there is, um, there's an argument that you're moving into a regime in which you get some extended uh, transport, or potentially as you go higher in mobilities, maybe even the development of a new band structure. So for us, this was kind of the tipping point. It was the opportunity to begin to move into a regime where you could think about charge uh, um, delocalization in these materials that was more akin to the band model or band development that we think of in bulk semiconductors. All right. So the strategy is in this is to take these types of inorganic structures um, functionalized with different organics that were used to help to control their growth and their organization, and then develop a tool set of chemistries and a, a wide community helped to develop different options here. We, we worked on a, a small subset, but in, in particular this isocyanide uh, ligand, which although it does have cyanide in the name, it is non-toxic. This was what I started, we, um, uh, uh, thanks maybe to uh, Sherry Kagan and her team too, we started thinking a little bit more about what would we do as these things uh, actually got used in, in larger scale and, and uh, had to think about all the consequences. So this material is actually uh, quite, a, quite a benign choice in terms of its, its properties. But the idea is to do an exchange that would then provide strong coupling and allow uh, electronic delocalization. And this um, process also had some uh, desirable elements in that it's an exchange process that could occur in the solid state. So you could make your devices, pattern them, um, and organize the material, and then expose selected areas to this molecule, and it would make those materials be electronically active. Any area that you did not expose to the molecule would remain insulating. So it was a way of building devices by a direct patterning based on, on the, um, the masking and the deposition of the ligand. Not that that's a terribly practical thing, but it allows you to begin uh, developing strategies for making different types of devices. Let me go a little further. So this exchange process and, uh, uh, is something that we, we care a lot about. So we actually set up to do a fair number of experiments to try to better understand the kinetics and what's involved. So this is kind of the extreme of complicated for experiments. So this is a synchrotron-based experiment where we actually are producing films of these materials at an interface where we can in introduce the new ligand underneath and allow it to start exchanging uh, the environment of the particles and then we watch that in real time with uh, grazing incidents, x-ray scattering. So a lot of work for this piece. Um, why would we go to that trouble? Well, it turns out that this exchange process is still one of the more challenging steps in order to get the properties that you want because of something you might be able to pick out in this image here and that is that as you take the materials and you do the ligand exchange to bring the particles closer together and get this strong electronic coupling, you're fighting against a, uh, a strong force that is contracting the overall structure. And those stresses lead to the development of defects, cracking, other things that are, are really uh, a problem in terms of reliability when you're doing fabrication. So the, the workaround for this usually is that you do it in multiple steps you deposit the material, you do an exchange, it develops some cracks, you deposit another layer of material, do the exchange, and, and the fortunate part is that the second layer tends to fill in naturally because of uh, capillary forces and other parts. It goes to the, to the defects, it fills in the gap. So if uh, by the time you do about three depositions, you have a very high yield in terms of the, uh, the 
um, uh, uh, devices that are electronically active, well behaved for further characterization. But we wanted to understand more about this exchange process and so un understanding a little bit about how we could optimize it, see if we could do a better job of controlling how strain developed in the films and also how, uh, how we controlled the uh, uh, relaxation of those films. Uh, kept us pretty busy. All right, I'm not gonna go into that piece. So let's move ahead a little bit further. That isocyanide group um, was uh, a lead uh, option in terms of the transformation of communication in these quantum uh, dot solids. And the, uh, the data that I'm showing here, sorry, it's a little arcane to be plotting this mobility versus, in, actually that should be inverse temperature, pardon me. But this plot in, uh, in this peak, what uh, is in, uh, even though it's not so dramatic looking, it's actually very important. And so actually for both of these. What this is showing is that the mobility in these materials gets better as you go lower in temperature. So why that's so important is that if you're in a regime where you're, you have hopping transport, then that, um, that mechanism requires that there is thermal activation to be able to move from one particle to the next. So the classic hallmark is that mobility improves as you uh, increase the temperature because you have that extra burst to get over the barriers that are, are getting in the way of charge transport. So with these results where the mobility goes up significantly as you go down in temperature, um, peaking depending on the design of the device and so on, but at temperatures even as low as you know, uh, uh, 150 uh, Kelvin or, or 200 Kelvin, again, depending on, on some of the details of, of how it was designed. That shows that this really is something that has transitioned a good portion of the transport into an extended coupled system where the particles have lost their individual character and now carriers are delocalized over a number of the neighbors. The mobilities in these systems, now they're up in the mid 30s, this was sort of around 30, but at that point that means that if you do a rough calculation, the charge is delocalized over something on the order of about a thousand quantum dots. And that gives you a sense of sort of a volume 10 by 10 by 10, all right? And that really means that you're getting to a point where you can think about these as being a system that's transitioned now to have its own emerging band structure. And so that was one of our big goals was, could we take artificial atoms and couple them in a way that you could begin to describe them as having delocalized um, um, coupling and maybe even bonding? The idea of shared electrons in a chemist's mind means that there's some type of, of, of bonding that helps to hold the system together um, physically. I don't know if the attractive energy is associated with those delocalized uh, electrons is strong enough to really make much of a contribution to the cohesive energy, but it certainly is a very important part of how we think about development of the um, electronic properties. The systems uh, next had uh, a step where we could take those inorganic cores and by exposing them either to a small excess of, uh, of a chalcogenide or to a metal source. This, these were lead selenide based materials in that generation. So that small shift in stoichiometry by changing the outer layer of atoms now gave us a handle that allowed us to switch between N and P type behavior. So you can imagine that by addition of a little bit more cation character or anion character, we recovered some of the appeal that the, uh, the uh, concepts in doping that um, traditional semiconductors, silicon technology, gallium arsenide and so on really rely on. So this surface or interfacial um, um, e exchange process actually leads to the opportunity to begin uh, producing both um, N-type and P-type devices and also to modulate the carrier density, which is very important also in the performance of these systems. So part of why we were excited in these systems, if you have a, an application in which silicon uh, can serve very effectively, it's not it's not a smart thing to, p to pick a fight with a well-established uh, technology with a trillion dollars of, of research and, de and development behind it. So uh, my view, actually working for a dozen years for IBM, is that if silicon does a very good job, that's where you really want to stay away from. And so we highlight things that allow um, uh, opportunities that silicon is not very good for. So we think about these kinds of systems more for flexible electronics 
and for systems that would exploit the ability to en uh, engineer the optical properties in ways that, that silicon and other conventional uh, semiconductors do not. So this is an example of, of one of the um, actually printed um, um, transistor arrays. The, it's made on plastic, and that's because all the steps that I mentioned that were high temperature occurred before you begin building your device. So the solution phase synthesis and some of the manipulations are done at high temperature to get the, pure, the, the crystal quality and purity, but then it's an ink that you can deposit and treat at room temperature to allow the formation of the other systems. And so this process is quite compatible with printing. So you can think about how you use a, a, a variety of current technology to print and, and make different types of contacts. Um, maybe the best way to think about how that proceeds is these are now uh, and this is work led by Sherry Kagan and her team, but demonstrations of, of, of not just individual devices, but now circuit elements, actually circuits, but the building blocks of digital and analog logic. So this is an amplifier and uh, a ring oscillator. You can do inverters, other types of things. So this is where you go from making individual devices and sort of establishing that delocalization of charge. So you say, hey, we've made a semiconductor, a new type of semiconductor. Um, and the, the transition was to then think about how do you begin building up a toolbox, which is now devices that can be interconnected to allow you to have circuit and system functionality. And for, uh, for these efforts, and I, let me make a second, take a second here. Um, we do these mostly on f flexible substrates in terms of the end goal, but it actually happens that processing on a silicon wafer is still convenient because of handling issues for certain tools. So we run some of these through the fabrication lines and other steps using the silicon as a carrier. But um, the numbers that I have, yeah, this is not so exciting, but well, it's important, but not so exciting. So this, uh, this is arrays of devices and the numbers that you see here are mapping all the different devices on a single run, showing the variation in the mobilities, tolerances, actually the, the thresholds are not shown here. But you begin to develop statistics that um, allow you to go from doing just you know, one device, getting it to work, right? And then figuring out how do I really understand this system? Well, I need to make hundreds or thousands of these and start to do lifetime tests, understand stability, what are the environmental. So this uh, process to be able to, to make the, the system on larger wafers and then run it through probe stations that can do the, um, the mapping of the wafer is an important step to, to transition these uh, systems. Um, the more device design for uh, inverters and other pieces. Let me go one step further. So. Um, I'll stop the, uh, this, the FET discussion with this particular example, but it does capture a lot of the things that we had been pushing for maybe over the last, say, 10 years or so. And that is that in this um, fabrication strategy, every component is, uh, is a nanocrystal ink. So the, um, the channel material is, is uh, the semiconductor quantum dots. In this case, it was cadmium selenide. But the metal contacts are made by um, a source uh, for the source and drain are silver particles with small amounts of indium particles that are introduced. The indium serves as a dopant uh, to passivate some of the um, semiconductor surfaces. The gate material is also made of, uh, of silver um, uh, nanoparticles. And the insulator is uh, particles of aluminum oxide. So all of this is printed. So this is a fully printed inorganic transistor that is, is built at room temperature. Um, these materials are, uh, are sensitive to um, air and moisture until they're packaged. So they're very much like uh, organic LED materials that um, you can build the materials in air, then you can uh, treat them, but when you go to use them, they do have to be encapsulated in a polymer layer or some type of barrier layer. So I should make sure that I acknowledge. We'd like to find ways that are more environmentally stable, but actually thin layers of silicon and other semiconductors also are, not, uh, are, are sensitive to environmental components. It's just silicon has a really good passivating uh, material, silicon oxide, that naturally comes with it. So that is a big advantage in that mode. Um, there's another mode to synthesis I'm not going to take you through today, but I want you to, uh, again, as a master class, I want you to be aware of the, um, uh, the, the power of these techniques. Uh, oh, I left the slide. So Paul Alvisados 
at Berkeley, and Libretto Mana, working partly with uh, 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 Paul Alvisados' team and then also in his work at his home institute in, in Italy, have championed uh, strategies that allow exchange of the internal components in these different types of quantum dots by a process that's referred to as cation exchange. <coughs> this is a remarkable process if you think about it from a bulk standpoint. So you can have a material like cadmium selenide, and if you expose it to other types of metal salts, on the nanometer length scale there's enough mobility and uh, potentially compliance in the lattice that these ions can displace the original metals and sit in the lattice that is preserved of the anion sites. So that allows you to transform the material from one um, class of semiconductors to another. And this is something that seems quite magical to an electrical engineer because usually you're sort of stuck with what you, uh, you, know, you deposited. So if you could grow one material and pattern it, you could choose later to turn it into a completely different material. You could make it active in the visible or the infrared. This flexibility, I think, was one of the most important contributions. Again, my hat's off to, the, uh, to others who push this forward. But this ability to transform materials um, uh, post-synthesis um, and, and also in situ allows you to uh, really widen the range of, uh, of compositions and structures that you can make. And the, um, the uh, strategy when we think about um, how we modify electronic properties is, uh, is augmented if we take our, our discussion about doping and let's, let's take it one level higher in the hierarchy. So if we think about our discussion about artificial atoms, we'd also like to know whether there's a, a way to actually have um, uh, a surrogate for substitutional doping that can be uh, done with um, nanocrystal substituents that are introduced into that uh, array system. So the depiction here is, is a dopant sitting in a silicon lattice providing an opportunity for a localized electronic state and this provides then um, free carriers that will modulate the electronic properties of the material. Can we think about a system in which we have inorganic uh, uh, semiconductor arrays that allow the introduction of a, a secondary material that will introduce new, in this case, quantum confined states, but that will serve the same function providing a, uh, an opportunity to change the carrier density in the materials. And so what we set out to do in this study was to take a super lattice of some of these semiconductors, and this is very high loading, probably more than you would uh, take advantage of in most applications. But the uh, lighter uh, structure in the background are the uh, parent semiconductor uh, materials, and the darker uh, particles that you see are gold that are inter uh, introduced into the, uh, into the lattice. And the important thing in that image is that um, if you can tune the size and shape and the surface structure of these uh, particles uh, precisely enough, then the artificial atoms allow um, a random substitution of their positions. And so this produces a, uh, a, or allows a new route in which you can introduce electronically or optically active components into the fabrication process and then allow a some more continuous tunability of composition. So the gold was chosen because it modifies um, uh, electrical conductivity in this case, over about six orders of magnitude, uh, four orders of magnitude, um, or also uh, offer some uh, opportunity to change optical properties based on plasmonic effects that we'll, we'll say a few more things about. So in, in this case, characterization is a challenge, though, so you do need to be able to use different techniques. We are trying, actually with the help of, of colleagues here in the Netherlands as well, but we're embracing more aspects of tomography. In this particular case, this was a study that was done with some great partners at NIST a number of years ago, but where we uh, look at a three-dimensional map to understand the positions of those uh, dopant uh, nanoparticles within the super lattice. And so this is uh, a fairly obvious concept to pursue, but it turns out that 
The, the headway was difficult because it was very hard to prove that you'd made a system that had these attributes of, of sort of a random substitutional system. And I do say random, I'll actually give one other caveat that we, we did learn, and it's in the paper too. But in the growth of these uh, superstructures, um, the, uh, the, dopant ad, the dopant particles, or whatever, I, now I'm going to get caught up in terminology, um, the gold particles in this case, they do uh, pretty much randomly distribute in the uh, upper layers, but the very first layer where the uh, material hits an interface is not a statistical um, uh, distribution. And that's because the interface energy of the particles with whatever the support was, whether that was a liquid surface or a solid surface, it's different enough that it changes the segregation. So that's something that we'll have to think about because it could impact certain types of device designs. But really what it probably means is we need to coat the surface with something that makes it neutral in terms of its affinity for both partners in the super lattice. And then I think that effect will go away. But there, there is that one caveat that through the majority of the film, it, it seems to behave uh, very much the way we would describe a, uh, a, uh, 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 a traditional inorganic semiconductor. All right. I'm going to say a couple things. I've got to be careful about timing and pacing so we have lots of uh, uh, chances for, uh, for uh, questions. I'm, I'm just going to show a few motifs in the, in, in the rare earth system. Because I, what I want to draw out now is this idea that we can control shape, size, and shape. So up until now, shapes have been pretty boring. The, the only examples I gave you were things that were relatively compact, spherical geometries, packing to uh, give you high density, so sort of FCC or, or, or HCP type character in terms of local uh, arrangement, actually generally uh, FCC favored for the systems I, I happen to have shown you. Um, but in a family of optically active materials that are based on, on rare earths, we have an interesting set of properties. So quantum dots have the property that you can excite them and have tunable emission over range by controlling the size and the shapes of the dots. But that can be a benefit, but it does mean that those two properties, the physical dimensions and geometry, are tied um, precise, or, um, uh, not precisely, um, but tied uh, 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 closely to the uh, optical properties. So rare earth uh, phosphors offer an interesting opportunity. Um, they can uh, undergo other types of, of optical processes, nonlinear processes, and so on. But maybe the most important thing is you can make those in different sizes and shapes, but the optical properties are determined by the dopants that are introduced during the crystal growth. So that means that you can decouple size and geometry of one optically, element, uh, optically active element, and you can take advantage of the shape and that engineering to get the superstructure and architecture that you want. So it allows you to have what, in chemist terms, we often uh, refer to things as being an orthogonal process, where you can tune one without messing up the other, right? So orthogonality and synthesis is something that you really shoot for. And so this uh, family of, of rare earths um, is, uh, is uh, really exciting in that aspect. There are also systems that are extremely important in modern technologies, uh, solid state lasers, sensors, um, the lights that we see here are compact fluorescent lights. So these are all based on the properties of phosphors using these families of, of, of rare earth dopants. The systems that we uh, are targeting are more in the families that are um, active in nonlinear optical properties, so that they will absorb two photons in the IR and give one back in the visible, or uh, one ultraviolet photon and give two back in the, in the, the visible. And, and that's uh, just an area that is of interest to us in terms of nonlinear uh, function. But these systems had already been demonstrated before we uh, began uh, contributing to the area to allow um, access to a variety of different morphologies um, based on the underlying crystal structure. Um, this is a solvothermal, actually this was a solvothermal synthesis uh, done by other researchers, uh, groups in China as well as at Princeton University helped to push forward this idea of doing a, a um, solution phase synthesis at high temperature. They caught our attention. And we wanted to help out too. So we uh, began uh, carrying out um, um, synthetic processes to see if we could do a, uh, a little bit more in terms of engineering the geometries and structures. So let me just show a couple of images here. So these are families in which you adjust the 
um, shape of the particles or the, sorry, shape of the particles or size of the particles, but these systems span from few nanometers up to hundreds of nanometers, but they do allow quite exquisite control of the size and faceting and ultimately even the surface termination of these systems. And so now we're starting to have things that have directionality in their interaction. And in keeping with my analogy of trying to turn this into chemistry in the sense of using our artificial atoms, this is hybridization. So we think about shape as being the surrogate for valency in, when we think about hybridization of atoms, whether something wants to have four nearest neighbors or, or uh, six nearest neighbors, symmetries that are accessible are now going to be dictated by the geometry in packing rather than the molecular orbitals or electronic orbitals of the individual atoms. And they're relatively uniform in, and you can see actually, I don't, it, it, it's just a fluke that there happen to be two here and two holes. I don't think they actually like popped out, but this is um, an example of the kinds of, of of sort of um, uh, assemblies that we would, uh, we would um, target in uh, beginning to integrate some of these uh, rare earth-based materials. I'm not going to take you through the, uh, um, the characterization of these pieces. But I will um, stop for a moment here to just say um, why it's important in our uh, efforts to push this forward to have more collaborations, more interactions. Um, this type of system requires many more skills than are found just in, in our lab's activities. So a lot of the packing motifs, maybe if I go back one. So when you think about the arrangement of these structures, simple close packing cannot, uh, or I should say, entropic effects, which uh, generally um, push the system towards um, sort of a densest uh, packing to optimize the energy of the system. Um, don't explain these types of arrangements of the, of the components. In order to get these particular types of architectures, you need um, some extra influence. And where we looked for this is in the realm of enthalpy. So basically the energy of, again, in chemistry terms, it's the bonding energy. It's the, the favorable, or in some cases unfavorable, but it's the interaction energy, and not just uh, being at the mercy of, of, of trying to minimize the energy of the system. In traditional colloid assembly processes, often it is the entropy that is the dominant term. It's still an important piece here, but this is our effort to try to, to make that leap so that it's really the, the connection between the components that becomes important. To do this, we needed to team up with folks that were experts in molecular dynamic simulations that would help us to simulate um, different types of organization properties. Um, we also needed to team up with uh, folks that uh, could help us to do modeling of the interfaces of the particles to help us to better understand what would be the directional, what types of directional interactions we should expect in the system. So the modeling of the system said there should be, and with molecular uh, dynamics, that there should be uh, certain ranges of energetic differences between the contacts between these particles. And the chemical question was, what is the origin of that difference and strength of bonding in different directions? And so we had chemical analysis that told us what was on the surface, but we couldn't tell what exactly the spatial distribution was. And so in this particular case, DFT calculations helped to encourage our proposal that there should be a difference in the bonding strength and density of ligands on specific facets. And as it turns out, the predictions based on DFT helped to reinforce the idea that there should be one family of planes that should be able to interact more favorably with each other than another set of combinations. And so that predicted difference in the um, density of ligand binding and therefore the strength of interaction helps to kind of uh, sync up with what we think about for this programming of the, of the organization of the systems. I'm not going to do the radioactive stuff. So um, these materials also have some other interesting properties, not the topic of our discussion today, but the lanthanides in particular, or rare earth materials, also have a number of, of stable isotopes, but also uh, radioactive isotopes. And so when you take a system um, in this family or the next, 
it does let you make some uh, materials that have kind of an interesting combination of uh, properties. So um, you can make these systems be simultaneously magnetically active with gadolinium. So they're MRI uh, active and, and can modulate the relaxation time. Um, they can host, and, and we have substituted in radioactive tracers, so you can follow them in absolute terms, in terms of, of uh, path bioaccumulation, other pieces. And they have nonlinear optical properties that allow you to shine infrared light further into the tissue and, and excite uh, transitions that are not possible with visible, uh, um, with visible reporters. So um, one of the areas that we think about in the isolated systems is, is having multifunctional tags so that you can correlate data from uh, several techniques. Um, the optical imaging has very high resolution but doesn't go as deep into the, into the structures. The MRI can reach very deep inside the structures but then you lose some of that spatial resolution. And then ultimately, the radioactive tracer is extremely sensitive to find wherever the components of that material went, because you can literally you know, track them down one, one uh, uh, gamma rate, one, one uh, 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 decay event at a time. So it gives us an opportunity to play some games in terms of that uh, piece of design. I'll uh, mention one piece in terms of you know, how this builds up in complexity. This is an active collaboration, actually, with researchers here in, in, uh, in Utrecht in, in Maryland Dijkstra's lab and, and, uh, and a number of other labs. But the complexity of the building blocks can actually extend significantly if we start thinking about processes in which we have um, uh, combinations of etching and regrowth. So if I have a, uh, a system, let's see. Um, so some of these now are taking advantage of tomographic techniques and uh, allowing us to think more about sort of what's the three-dimensional structure of individual particles. Again, learning from our collaborators and others to better embrace this idea about, uh, about um, uh, sort of uh, understanding all of the, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, shape attributes um, that sometimes are missed in planar imaging. We were in discussion even earlier today about this piece. Actually, if I go back one, let's see if that guy runs, but you'll see one piece. So one thing is this is kind of a little bit lumpy at the top where a second rare earth has been grown. There's also a concave region uh, on, on the average particles, and this is represented if we do hundreds of these. But this, um, some of these details are actually kind of important in the properties and also the interactions of the particles, but they're lost when you do an ensemble average of the structure. So if we take data from a collection of these systems with plan view, we lose most of the um, subtle details about these types of, of, of uh, roughness, roughness effects and other pieces in the design. All right. So rare earth systems are another family that we can draw on to do our building. And they have some uh, nice attributes that they are size and shape controllable, even with fairly complicated shapes. But they also allow this possibility of introducing different types of uh, optical resonances by the choice of the dopants. So you can take one parent structure, keep the size and shape the same, and move around the optical resonances depending on what type of, of dopant you want to introduce into the system. All right. I'm going to mention, I'm not going to talk about metal plasmonics, but I'm going to watch that. That's definitely not the right time. Uh, let's see. Uh, this one is, yeah, OK. So I'll. I'll mention uh, one system that is kind of emerging in this space in plasmonics. And then if my timing is right uh, for this piece, we're at the about one hour mark, um, then maybe we'll have a quick, uh, a, a little bit of a break. If you want to ask some questions, people want to stretch a little bit. I, I know how hard it is to follow. Nobody wants to hear me talk for two hours or whatever straight. Um, but it's a, it's a chance just to sort of uh, refocus a little bit once we get past the components. Um, we do work on gold and, and other types of, of systems, and we've offered s uh, some uh, recipes now that have been commercialized just as a modification of existing uh, uh, gold uh, plasmonic uh, resonators. But this work is, is something it's, we're proud of it. It's, I, I think it's helpful, but really the, 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 the big steps here were work by um, Mustafa El Sayed and uh, Kathy Murphy and um, Luis Liz Marzan. There's a whole collection of, of people that really worked very hard to understand more about the properties of, of the gold rods and, and their, their potential. 
uh, what we did was then take uh, some of our surfactant engineering and our understanding about how to uh, sort of better optimize the, the growth and kind of map that on to their recipes. And, and so what that does is allow tunability uh, throughout the infrared with a little higher yield and, um, and allows uh, scalability. So now you can sort of work in, instead of sort of milliliter scale, you can work at liter scale, which um, that's actually kind of important if you want to make more of these materials. I, I was very nervous as an advisor, when you have students that are starting to, to work with gold salts at liter scale to make these systems, you really don't want a reaction to go bad, right? You got a lot invested in this piece. Same with the platinum and other things that we do. So yield is important if you want to think about scale up and, and in the designs. But it also, these, um, these efforts do, and this is the work of uh, Xing Chen Yi, a wonderful student uh, who uh, now is an in, uh, in his independent career at, uh, at uh, Indiana University. He really led this effort within my group. And uh, I had not gone near uh, aqueous syntheses and, and, uh, and gold systems until, uh, un, until his interests helped to, to drive me there. But um, the systems actually are, are quite uniform in their physical overall dimensions, but they're also quite uniform in terms of the expression of specific facets and other pieces. And, and you, you could take examples from other contributors in this field. It's, it's evolved quite significantly to have a lot of control over detailed microstructure in these systems. And that's very helpful as you start to think about how we're gonna, uh, would take advantage of these to, to build up extended structures. All right, before we uh, break, I will just mention one uh, one piece and the and the IR example. So um, coupling. We're going to come back to coupling. Um, so when you take gold structures and you engineer their size and geometry, you can tune the optical resonances over an interesting range, and that's been the subject of lots of great science and interesting technology opportunities that are being explored in that space. But it would be nice if you could take a material and you could tune it by the types of, of controlled interactions that I mentioned before with the semiconductor work. And so what we focused on was this idea about using different types of ligand exchange to modulate the communication between um, uh, plasmonic uh, components so that you could sort of have a, I guess, a synthetic metal that, uh, that has different degrees of delocalization depending on what the surface termination was. So you could go from systems that were largely isolated to systems that began to show a shifted resonance in terms of their properties, ultimately to systems that were strongly coupled and started to behave more like granular gold, and do that in steps that were really controlled by just something on the order of you know, one CH group, one carbon uh, bond length in, in, uh, in, uh, in terms of the interactions. And so, again, for physicists or optical engineers, this is um, a very common way to view your data, but for chemists, maybe a little different, depending on the mix in our audience. So these are the, um, the optical responses of the systems I was just describing. And what they're showing are the real and imaginary part. So the real index of refraction and this imaginary part is basically the resonance or the, or the, uh, uh, the absorption or scattering that's associated with these uh, systems. But the imaginary part in particular is the loss. So as you go across increasing the amount of coupling, you can have some very interesting effects. So this basically behaves like an isolated resonator. So um, something that is insulating with no communication between the constituents or in this system, you can engineer the coupling so that the index of refraction, actually the real index of refraction, goes almost to zero. And that's kind of a funny point. So many interesting optical effects are potentially accessible when you get uh, a material where the epsilon is uh, near zero. Because light doesn't want to live in that environment anymore. It's a discontinuity. So if you think about the ability to design um, systems, this idea about having systems where you could intentionally go very close to zero or even cross zero brings new opportunities in design because photons don't want to be there at all. And if you go to higher order corrections, then you see that there's some probability. But it allows you to make mirrors that have extremely high finesse, um, high reflectivity, but 
can be um, much, much smaller than the normal wavelength or, or penetration depth of light. So new opportunities come with that piece. The one that you're more probably familiar with is the idea of a negative index of refraction. So that's what we think about with optical design, where the resonance in the material actually turns over and you have the behavior ultimately of resonant metals like gold and silver. So with this idea about controlling the coupling, you can move continuously between the regimes of isolated resonators or a system that starts to behave like a continuous metal and choose what set of optical properties you need for your application. And the other piece that is kind of helpful in this is that because it's all solution processed, you can use, again, printing or stamping or other techniques. So in this example, these are arrays that are made from these uh, gold nanoparticle inks that are coupled to their neighbors by the, uh, by the surface exchange. And uh, maybe it's better to see here. So these are the resonances that those different systems um, um, uh, show. This is the simulation. These are the real data. So these resonances are the plasmonic resonances, now not of the individual particles, but of the superstructures. So if you make a disk or a rod or create a structure where the inside is made of these uh, nanoparticle inks, now you can tune the optical resonance over a very wide range and you can use the same material and same processing. The only thing you have to choose is what's the last step when you want to exchange the surface to pick the, uh, the optical uh, wavelength range where it'll be active. And I think that offers a lot of interest in terms of how we would um, develop, again, solution processable, integratable materials that have tunable uh, uh, tunable uh, optical properties. Last piece, and then we're going to take a break. Most of plasmonics research has focused on um, classic, or what are now classic systems, of, of silver, gold, alloys of these. Um, some examples, however, that are very important extend into um, the, the realm of dope semiconductors. The first of the systems in this family to be recognized was uh, indium uh, uh, dope tin oxide, but if you have a, oh, do I actually have a picture? Yeah, okay, so if we look at this uh, phase space for plasmonic materials, you have an axis where you have very high carrier concentrations, um, alkali metals, gold, silver, things that have um, basically every atom in the structure is contributing carrier, uh, free carriers that are then available to participate in a resonance. However, there's a whole host of other materials which, if we control the doping, also have free carriers that can uh, couple to an external uh, um, uh, light field. And that resonance now has the characteristics that it's tunable based on the, uh, the number of carriers that are introduced into the material. So you have one material. As you change the doping, the resonance can shift. It is also sensitive to shape and some other things that, that I'll, I'll, I'll show in a moment. But this family of systems is quite intriguing because it offers plasmonic function that is tunable through the mid-infrared to near-infrared, even getting uh, a little higher up in, in, in uh, uh, edging towards the visible. However, um, it has a couple of, of notable features. One is because these are dopants that are introduced into a parent semiconductor, um, doping levels usually top out in 10 or maybe even up to almost 20 percent, but the strength of the resonance is proportional to the number of carriers. So you'll never get a semiconductor dope system where the amplitude of the resonance is going to compete with gold or silver because only a small subset of the atoms, well, maybe a few percent, tens of percent, are contributing those carriers. So that's a, that is a potential limitation if you want something that is just based on the strength of the uh, resonance. But it turns out in plasmonics, that's usually not the problem. It's not the strength of the resonance. It's actually the, the ability to tune and have a very narrow, what's called a, a, a figure of merit for this or quality factor. And so one of the things that is exciting in this space is that you can tune the materials over a very wide uh, range of energies by, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't, uh, I kept the abbreviations. Not this is a uh, work of ours, but it's indium tin oxide, uh, tin dope cadmium oxide, aluminum dope cadmium oxide, 
uh, that's uh, uh, gallium and indium again. So this is a, parent, a, a family of, of, of oxide semiconductors. It's telling me to, to, to make my transition to a break. Um, that has um, resonant properties that are, are adjustable based on the, uh, the introduction of, of different uh, types of dopants. Let me go one, okay. Maybe this pot says enough. So, and I'm sorry, it's a little small. Do I have a blow up of that? Well, okay, so if you, if you take a look at this image, this is 1550, so that's sort of a telecom wavelength that's, that's important in, uh, in uh, a variety of detector technologies in other parts. So it's one of the reasons that this was a, uh, a target zone for, uh, for our activities. But this blue curve is a very narrow resonance. It can be tuned based on the, the doping, although it gets a little broader as you move out to longer, uh, longer wavelengths. But this um, feature in here has a width uh, that is uh, narrower than gold or silver's resonance in, as a function of its position. So the figure of merit for these materials is better than the best gold or silver resonators in their own optimal range of, of operation. And the amplitude is about a factor of 10 smaller than, than uh, the metals. But the, the, the feature that is most attractive in these is the fact that it's such a sharp resonance to be uh, engineered. And we can keep the size and shape of the particles the same and change the dopant to move the resonance. Or we can change the amount of dopant and adjust the size and shape of the particle again to modify the resonance. So it gives us this ability to have orthogonal uh, tuning of the, of the properties of the system. Um, one of the uh, pieces that we'll come back to later is this idea of, of, uh, of up conversion and, and how we, all right, you know what? This is a good stage to, to make a, a little bit of a transition. I'll tell you about how the properties of the systems that I've now laid out as my building blocks, what happens when you start putting these together? What happens when different classes of materials start to uh, talk to each other? And that sort of sets the stage for the, the last half of this master class, which is really about um, multi-component design. We've got building blocks, size and shape control. We've introduced doping and coupling as strategies for how we modify their properties. And now we get to do more fun things, which is to try to make new materials based on those constituents. So um, maybe we'll start with this. Uh, this piece, we'll talk about how we start putting a few components next to each other and see how their properties interact. And then we'll take that step to design of, of, three dimension, of extended two-dimensional and three-dimensional architectures for the organization. And so this is one of the experiments, taking the components that we had just talked a little bit about, where we have um, uh, an array of the uh, rare earth uh, resonators that have uh, nonlinear optical properties. In this particular case, um, the uh, feature of up conversion. So they absorb in the infrared and then allow the, uh, uh, the sequential absorption of two photons that will then ultimately be um, converted into one radi or a percentage of those. Uh, excitations will then result in a single higher energy photon that is released. So in this particular uh, architecture, we have um, a self-assembled array of the gold resonators, a thin spacer layer that we control the, the thickness of, and then a layer of these uh, uh, rare earth uh, phosphors on top. And the experiment that's being done here is to try to understand whether you can uh, modify the emissive properties of the uh, of the rare earths by allowing coupling to the plasmonic field of the resonator. So there's something that's referred to the, as the Purcell enhancement. And what that means is that in the presence of a strong electric field, there should be a change in the lifetime and the probability of a transition in a nearby optically active dipole. Okay? And so this is a, a feature that is used in different areas of physics and sort of to understand local coupling, but it's become very, uh, a very hot topic because it leads to a the possibility of a fluorescence enhancement or modulation of lifetime that could uh, significantly improve the utility of a number of these different uh, types of, of, of emitters. So in a blanket system, you can look at the um, the emission, uh, this is two-photon up-converted emission, as we go from the green 
uh, which is a fairly large spacing through uh, five, so 10 nanometers, five nanometers, and then ultimately two nanometers. One of the things that you'll note is that as you go through this system, it goes through a resonance. So um, the five nanometer spacing is significantly more intense in its emission properties than either the thicker spacing or the, or the thinner spacing. And the reason for that is as you make, if, if uh, let's start in the, in the more distant case. If you're too far away from the antenna, from the resonator, then the optical emitter doesn't feel the presence of the electric field. It doesn't penetrate for, far enough. So basically, you don't have much change in the optical properties of the system. As you bring that metal resonator closer and closer, the field starts to interact with the particles, and that strong oscillating electric field begins to increase the, uh, the uh, optical transition probability in the, in the system. So you uh, see this increase, but the, um, the effect will turn over because of a quenching phenomena. So if you bring a metal system too close to the optical emitter, the probability that that optical excitation will um, relax by exciting some of the, the carriers that are in the metal becomes much higher. So that's a quenching phenomenon. So it's a, an example where precisely tuning the strength of interaction is important because it reaches an optimum in, uh, in, in the design. And that depends on what the particular emitter is, its lifetime, and the physical size. It also um, uh, depends on the strength of the electric field that comes from the antenna. But it shows an example of how you need to sort of do some fine tuning in this piece. It's easier to understand the effect or to better map the effect if instead of putting the um, phosphors down on a, a continuous layer of the plasmonic resonators, you actually uh, take advantage of a trick and, and pattern the placement of the resonators first. And so now you have a system where only the regions that are close to the uh, to the uh, resonator should see an enhancement in their fluorescence properties, while the regions that don't have an antenna should have the background signal of the original phosphor. So it helps you to get away from the, any risk that you have uh, um, uh, a poorly uh, calibrated uh, optical response. Because the only source for this uh, enhanced luminescence is the uh, property of this uh, increased uh, luminescence efficiency. So theory would predict that in some systems it might be possible to get hundreds or even thousands of times enhancement in optical properties. Since you can only have a quantum yield of one, that really is only relevant if it starts out really bad to begin with, right? So um, that, that is a little bit of a, an issue when you think about these systems is that you're still limited by, by the overall efficiency in terms of quantum yield or um, changes in, in lifetime. But if we use um, uh, different size spacers or choose between gold or silver as the resonators, so I apologize, it's kind of in small print, but that's a 50x enhancement in the optical yield. So, so the co-location or juxtaposition, let's say, the close association between the plasmonic resonator and the nonlinear emitter means that you can get 50 times higher quantum yield from that two photon process than when the antenna is not present. And so that's a big deal for a lot of applications where you want to do things that involve tagging or conversion of light or other things. This is a very interesting, you know, a good motivation for why you want to be able to, to organize these different materials together. Another way to test a, a related phenomena is to take advantage of something that's called templated assembly. And so this is a process in which you take particles that are um, not spread on, on a flat interface, but a system in which you've already done a little bit of, of, of work up front by creating a surface topology. That could be a substrate that has a wrinkled structure or roughened by different processes. We tend to use lithography as the means of, of controlling the placement of the systems. And there are other groups that have done beautiful work in this regard in terms of, of understanding more about colloidal assembly using uh, these techniques. Probably the best developed methods are things that work on sort of hundreds of nanometers to sort of micron scale. Uh, there are some things that become a little more challenging as you move down to just few nanometer scale. But this is a way to um, take advantage of, of some of the kind of lock and key placement to study this, uh, uh, the same effect. So in this example, we can use lithography to create a structure in which 
there is space for one of the larger um, um, uh, emitter particles to fit, but they can't fit into the arms. And the arms are designed so that they're the right size to put one of these gold uh, particles, for example, in, in the placement. Um, which side the gold is on is actually, um, it's, it's not 100% controlled, but it's generally controlled by the direction in which you move the liquid interface um, with a, a, a um, sort of a, a sharp edge. It's basically uh, akin to something that's called a doctor blade, or we use uh, often, we, we use the term in, in uh, also a squeegee. If it's a soft uh, uh, um, uh, polymeric uh, 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 interface, then that allows you to control the deposition of the material into the topology. It also has this feature that as you move that soft um, uh, uh, system over the surface, it cleans away any of the particles that didn't fall into the, into the topology. So it's a way of getting rid of some of the background structure as well. So there are a couple things that come from these kinds of experiments. It allows you to build um, a series of structures that have controlled um, arrangements of the emitter and the antenna. And then it, because you know where they are, you've actually indexed the positions, you can then do the optical spectroscopy and the electron microscopy on the same spot. And that's kind of important because then you get to measure all those distances that we said were really important in terms of not just the average distance between the emitter and the, and the structure, but what happens when one of the pieces is out of place. Uh, maybe this guy actually is slightly closer in to this side than it is to the other side. So otherwise, we might not know why there was a stronger response than actually we had predicted uh, for the system. Um, this is the polarization data. So if you excite in uh, this plane, it couples very efficiently to the resonator, and you get a very large enhancement in the two-photon upconversion of the, of the rare earth. But if you send light in that is uh, that is um, polarized perpendicular to the antenna, it doesn't couple to the light field, and so you don't get any enhancement because you haven't uh, developed a strong electric field to drive that uh, Purcell uh, 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 resonance. And so these kind of structures with the, um, the um, uh, templated assembly allow us to kind of bridge between systems. We can think about our analogy of, of atoms and artificial atoms going up to uh, uh, um, extended materials, but I wanted to stop just for a moment to make the connection to molecules. So systems in which you have discrete subsets of these nanometer sized particles, so they're templated and, and organized in, in, um, in these arrays, but then you still have a finite number of those objects. And so in some ways, this is kind of the uh, oligomers or small molecule design. But again, the hybridization and the interaction between these systems allow you to look at, uh, and this is across a uh, range in the infrared. So each one of these spectra is the uh, response of an individual um, uh, cluster. And you will see that they're centered on certain uh, uh, positions, but each one is a little different, and that's because Unfortunately, everything matters. So you can see that there's a little bit of a defect or a slight difference in spacing. Um, I should have blown this up a little more. So each one of these three, as an example, has a slight difference in the packing density, but the position of that imperfection is different in, the, in all three. Otherwise, you would say they're actually pretty similar in terms of size and shape, but it makes a difference in the, um, the fine structure of, of the different um, higher order modes in, in the resonance. And so I guess the, the interesting news is, yeah, it's all tunable. The challenge is that you really have to have an awful lot of, of, of precision in the placement if you want to take advantage of some of those small, uh, those very sharp resonances. So this is work by Nick Graybush, a, a joint student between myself and uh, um, Sherry Kagan. And so Nick uh, recently graduated, but he was helping to uh, develop the methods for the lithography and localization of these particles and also the techniques to um, begin to put those um, systems together with uh, different components. One of the things that we had some fun with was this idea of being able to use, again, sort of lock and key. So if you, if you make um, template structures that um, will trap particles of specific geometries, but then leave a little bit of extra space available. You can fill those with 
uh, with one particle if if um, the space only allows uh, you know is is sized so that it's uh, it, it only one extra particle can fit or in this case by putting in slightly smaller particles or or etching a little bit more to make a larger hole you can have room to have groupings of particles now this is our first efforts at hetero integration right so again this is molecules but now it's two different types of artificial atoms that have been spatially positioned around each other to, to start uh, thinking about the building blocks. So what we want to do is think, if this is the motif that is the, is the fundamental building unit in symmetry, then can we take these kind of ideas and replicate them in space so that that becomes the unit cell and you build out a three-dimensional structure that captures all the key distances and interactions in the system. And that's the goal for this part of our discussion, is how do you make that link to start to um, build materials that, that incorporate multiple physical functions and start to allow you to, um, uh, to um, mix those responses. All right, I'm not going to go through the other uh, pieces on the design. All right, so, um, well, maybe to motivate, I'll just give this example. So we did talk about semiconductor materials. We talked about plasmonics. So just as a motivational uh, piece, this system is two different types of particles that are assembled together. One is uh, doped uh, oxide with a resonance at about 1.5 uh, uh, microns. Um, that comes from the plasmonic interaction. And this uh, other system is a quantum dot that has an absorptive interaction at about 1.5 microns. And so these are some of our first efforts to try to see whether we can begin to use the strategy of pairing up local electrical um, field uh, 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 um, uh, increases due to the antenna effect with uh, with quantum uh, emitters that are tuned to have um, a synergistic interaction. So, but in this case, they're now tiled. Rather than being individual structures, they're um, assembled into an extended 3D crystal structure. Actually, this guy is also um, uh, happens is a chiral crystal structure. So, although we didn't get good polarization data yet, but part of the motivation is this particular crystal structure has a helical axis. So um, the hope was that you would have uh, the interaction between the chiral properties and the uh, and the um, the polarization of the exciting light in this piece. Haven't gotten that far yet. We still got work to do. All right. So. The uh, ways that we could begin putting some of these systems together, this is not a new theme in terms of, 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 of our efforts, but it, it is a, a, a sort of an extended build. And it has become an area where I'm very impressed by all the great work that's being done uh, around the world now in terms of using these strategies to build um, very high quality components, but then to organize them into extended systems. So um, there is, uh, there's a, a, a nice, uh, community uh, that is contributing now to this idea that you can have sort of a modular design of solids drawing from different classes of, of components. Our first efforts in this area stretch back to sort of the um, early 2000s, uh, some work that we shared in 2004 in this particular example, but where combinations of semiconductors and, um, and metal particles are co-assembled, actually these guys were, sorry, iron oxide and semiconductor in this example, there are other pieces, but this is our effort to start us to see whether we could get co-organization of two different classes of materials that generally are, are not, you know, not found together. There's a small set of magnetic semiconductors, diluted magnetic semiconductors, and they're interesting, they're interesting systems, but we wanted to see whether we could point a way to, to how you might get um, the integration of these two properties where the magnetic moments of, of one constituent could influence the spin carrier uh, dynamics and, and, and properties in, in a neighboring component. And the tricky part about that is you have to have everything that's within the delocalization length of the, of the carriers. So it really has to be coupling on the scale of just a nanometer or two. Any longer than that, and there's no coherence between the carriers, and we're back into this sort of hopping regime. So you need to have a system where you're, you're kind of approaching this, um, uh, this idea that you have delocalized carriers in the system. Maybe blow that up a little bit more. So this is uh, packing of these systems. Um, 
uh, these crystal structures are, are binary uh, super lattices or binary colloidal crystals, depending on sort of which size scale you, you, you look at these systems from, uh, represent an effort to try to begin organizing these pieces. Nature was ahead of us on this, by the way. So um, earlier efforts and, and also great uh, physics experiments and other things through the, the uh, about two decades that preceded um, my interest in these pieces. But natural systems show the ability to organize um, multiple components when you have a coincidence in the, um, in the size scale. So this is a natural opal, happens to be from a Brazilian deposit, but these are naturally um, uh, formed silica spheres that happen to be in a deposit where the system went through two stages of nucleation. So it just naturally has a two, uh, uh, a bimodal size distribution. And this particular gem had, had really beautiful properties because it had a size of the constituents that allowed the small particles to sit just in the spaces between the large particles. And there are a lot of defects. If you actually look through here, you know, sometimes there are, there are some intermediate sized particles that sort of uh, precipitate out at the barriers. But this is a natural system uh, trying to explore this space. In the late 1990s, uh, Kylie and Schifrin did some very nice experiments where they looked at monolayers of, of two different sizes of gold particles and then also uh, the first example of a, of a binary material that I would say is contributing to this was in using silver and gold particles together. Um, but we thought, and, and it, was, it was beautiful work, but still monolayer and relatively small scale, so we felt we could help a little bit here in terms of translating some of these ideas about the organization. So, this is a panel uh, that motivates a lot of this work. Um, uh, these uh, particular images came from work with uh, a couple of uh, former students now off on their independent careers, but also uh, um, Elena Shevchenko and Dmitry Talapin, two former postdocs of mine, Elena at uh, 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 <coughs> Argonne National Labs and Dmitry at the University of Chicago. Had, begun some of the studies of, of these uh, binary systems in, uh, in an effort to kind of fill out our <coughs> understanding of what, what we could produce with this modular assembly process. So these are one to one stoichiometries, two to one, uh, two to three, uh, one to three. So marching up in complexity so that <coughs> by the time we get up here, we're looking at systems that have, uh, uh, you know, uh, 13, uh, uh, 13 small particles for every one of the large particles. And finally, maybe if we have time, we'll just show a couple of images, um, not maybe the focus of today's discussion, but these are quasi-crystalline phases. So I've been talking mostly about systems in which there is regular crystalline organization from these uniform particles, and that is a possible outcome. You can also make glassy or disordered phases where there's only local uh, positioning of the particles, but the other part that that, that I'll just, um, in case I don't get to it in detail, you can produce um, materials where the shapes are slightly mismatched so that they want to pack fairly densely, but they don't quite have the, the right symmetry. And so when that circumstances arises, the system can um, tile together but not have translational order. And those are the hallmarks of an aperiodic system that is, uh, and, and a particular member of that is what are called quasi-crystals. So they have rotational symmetry but no translational symmetry. So m almost all the richness of different modes that we think about in traditional solids on how we organize the components are available if we use these artificial atoms. I'll focus primarily on the crystalline examples because they're much easier to, to characterize and, and uh, uh, it allows us to understand the positions and the distances much more precisely than when we have glassy systems or, or the uh, quasi-crystalline systems. Um, the uh, work in this space, I, I highlight one example here from Ray Schacht and his group um, in the time period just after we had, had uh, shared some of the work on, on uh, the earlier example. The reason that I note this was this showed the robustness of the of the process because it was an unintentional result. They were doing very nice work on synthesis of, of, uh, of uh, some uh, intermetallic particles, but the synthesis, and uh, I give the student a lot of credit that they ran down, it didn't go the way they wanted, but they were still curious enough to try to figure out you know, why that one failed. So it turned out that a synthesis that generally uh, 
produced just a single component system had accidentally had a secondary uh, nucleation event, very much like the geologic example that we discussed before. And so naturally from that process, they identified the same binary phases that we had been working really hard to make um, by our design methods. And this was a sobering fact. Then you kind of, you, you, it's a humbling experience when you realize this piece. They're very good chemists too. But it's the fact that these systems are not um, uh, rare events. They're actually thermodynamically quite a good solution to the efforts to try to optimize the packing. So even the keys there though are the relative size ratio and choice of the ligands on the surface is also valuable, but most of this is driven by the efficient packing of these um, uh, constituents so that the packing density of the materials, actually let me go back one. So this is packing density as a function of the radius uh, ratio between the small and large particles. So all, the range in here is right around where you get FCC and, and uh, HCP packing just above 70%, so around 74%, and BCC packing down in this territory. But um, any of the systems that get close to that uh, in density um, to this 0.7 ratio have a fighting chance to be stable under the conditions of, of the design. So they will be stable against separation just in entropic terms because they can have a higher density than the separated components would have. So things down below that part can be made, and we need to understand whether they're metastable or not, but things that are above this line actually are truly thermodynamically stable. They are the best solution and better than having the uh, separation of the components. All right, so you can treat these materials like you would any other crystalline system. It's just that the length scales now have been stretched out. So these types of super lattice structures, you can do the crystallography, so tilting the sample, looking at different crystal phases. So we spend a lot of time doing this kind of work, and I'm not going to drag you through it too much. But I, what I want to sort of put forward is this idea that it's it's a good transition point to begin using the formalism and the um, sort of um, the treatment that you would in material science characterization of any um, uh, normal inorganic material and to map that, that description onto these type of super assemblies. So this is a, a stereo projection that shows the, the march as we change the tilt angle and go through the three-dimensional uh, crystals alignment and if we've done this right, as we tilt the sample and look at the, um, at the images and the diffraction data, we should be able to map out each of the major uh, crystal axes, just like we would with a, with a normal single crystal. And so when you do that, you can compare the real space images and the diffraction images to simulations of the same as you march through all of these uh, different axes. So, it's, it's a very busy slide, but this is in the background that says, you know, this is how we understand or assign the particular structure for any one of the other images that I'm going to show you is that we've mapped it in 3D by uh, taking the sample and tilting it and imaging it at each of the major uh, axes. And to be fair, we don't do that with every sample. What we do is we, we um, characterize the key reflections of each class and then we use comparisons between those and the other samples. And if it's publication or, you know, it's really important to make sure you got it right, then that one you put through the extra piece. So the amount of time it takes to do the full crystallographic study of each one is, is not practical for every sample. But it, it allows you to build up these ideas about how we organize. I mentioned that I, I, I apologize. I, I'm not going to talk as much about magnetics. This happens to be a magnetic example. But this is a, uh, maybe just in the, in, the, in the words of this coupling phenomena. So this is a hard magnet, very high coercivity. This is a soft magnet. When nature generally gives you the two flavors, but rarely the two uh, coexisting uh, with, uh, with soft, uh, sorry, uh, with uh, high moment and high coercivity simultaneously. But in order to get the maximum energy density, you actually want both of those parameters to be, uh, to be large values, high values. So this is what's called an exchange spring magnet. So if you measure the magnetic properties of the separate components, and then you couple them together through this process, you get about a 30% increase in the energy density of the magnet. And that's because the hard magnets extend a, a restraining force on the spin system of the higher moment constituents. And um, actually, very high performance uh, 
neodymium iron boron magnets and, and other systems that you actually probably do experience in your lab life, they actually have a natural structure that looks not as regular as this, but that's the origin of the high moment in those systems is they, through the metallurgy, they're heated and natural precipitation on fine length scales results in little pockets of different compositions. Some of those pockets are high moment material and some are high coercivity material. And it's the, the spring coupling through the exchange, uh, it's exchange coupling that gives a spring effect that, that holds those pieces together. All right. We make these materials in forms that are deposited on substrates or sometimes on liquid interfaces. The example that I'm presenting here are uh, material that's been formed at a liquid interface. If I go back to this piece, so there are some advantages in uh, the ability to study the materials, but also to form the systems and then transfer them for subsequent integration for fabrication. If you make a, uh, a layer on a liquid or a soft, in some cases a soft polymer or other pieces, but where the material will spread over the surface wet and then dry slowly, you can form these super lattice structures, but then you can lift off that material and stamp it and put it down in a different uh, uh, region. And I want to be uh, uh, you know, fair and just to, to, to better represent. So this is an ordered, oriented domain, but these materials are not single crystalline across their length. They're really polycrystalline materials. So if you zoom out, you can see sort of on a micron scale bar or you know, better samples on 10 microns or so on. But the domains that we make in these systems are never more than, say, 100 microns in size. And so you have islands sometimes with slight variations in, in thickness, but this represents this idea that you have sort of a large oriented domain, a grain boundary, another domain. So you should think about these as being sort of polycrystalline materials. And that is a limitation for certain applications um, where transport across grain boundaries is, is uh, pro uh, uh, potentially um, uh, problematic for devices. But actually, many of the devices that we make are, the active area of the devices is much smaller than the size of the of the grain boundaries or defects. So the, the one thing that we need to understand is how do we control it so that we minimize the probability that if it has a defect, it'll end up in a part of the device that, that matters. That's still a bit of a challenge in this piece. Um, as we look at these systems, this is one of these membranes. Uh, this guy is actually, uh, I think this is one unit cell thick. So there's another layer of part particles underneath it. But this is, uh, a support, and then it's an open structure. So this is a membrane that's stretched out over the surface of, of a grid that has holes in it. And so that's a way that we can study the properties of the particles without the influence of the, of the substrate, which is helpful sometimes. Um, you can make slightly more complicated systems. Others had pioneered work in using three, 3D systems. Actually, Daniel von Mockelberg in particular um, was the, the first group that I know of that made successfully the three uh, three component nanocrystalline systems, and that sort of shows a proof of concept of how you can uh, extend these to, uh, to greater complexity. All right. um, where we move now with these kind of processes is to go to robotic handling. So now we do the growth of these types of systems using uh, uh, generally, you can do spin on coding, but the length scale of ordering there is, is, is still fairly short range. If you do a slower process, um, like dip coating, where you have a mixture of the, of the constituent particles in a, a solution, and you dip a wafer in and, or, or a plastic substrate, and then withdraw it slowly, then you can control the drying rate so that these uh, super lattice domains grow over the surface of the wafer. And then that allows you again to go in and map in real space or by diffraction, the organization and understand the uniformity of the films and so on. But again, I would stress that this is not all one crystal domain. It's made up of a sort of a polycrystalline network of, of, the, of the different components. All right, not gonna do solar cells. Uh, let's do, let's do, all right, put plasmonics together. So when you start to, um, uh, design systems that have combinations of, of interactions, then one of the things that we were talking about before was the ability to kind of make this connection between um, single molecule type spectroscopy, individual structures, and what's the property of the extended film. And so this kind of experiment where we look very early in the nucleation of 
one of these super lattices offers us an opportunity where we can map one-to-one -one structure onto, uh, in this case, optical function. So this is um, uh, just after the nucleation of a series of these islands. And with more material, they would grow out to begin to uh, connect to each other. And everywhere that there's a misoriented island would ultimately have some type of a grain boundary. But we can go in and do optical spectroscopy on each one of these. But because they have unique shapes and we can index them, then we can, we can do the optical spectroscopy on a box that's just a few microns. But then we can go in and do the, um, the electron microscopy so we can do a one-to-one -one mapping. So this correlative microscopy is one of the things that is becoming increasingly important. The sequence is important, though. You can measure the optical properties and then do the electron microscopy afterwards, but you can't do the, micros the electron microscopy first because the electron beam is too damaging to the sample. So it causes shifts, the deposition of carbon, other pieces. So the downside of this approach is you have to be patient. You basically have to map all the sample optically and then go back to the select reference points and do the electron microscopy. The positions that you see here are the position of a plasmonic resonance that's shifted um, away from uh, its, its normal parent value because it's <coughs> coupled um, uh, the, uh, the, in this case, iron oxide is, is uh, changing the coupling between the neighboring gold. <coughs> The position of the resonance is almost identical between all these different islands. The only thing that's changing is the amplitude of the resonance. And that's because there are different numbers of layers in the island. So the, the, our goal here was to try to understand, as those nuclei grow, are there, um, is there really a lot of heterogeneous broadening from st structure to structure? Or do they all really have a response where you can describe it as being representative of the underlying architecture. So back to my comment near the first about we want to be studying the inherent properties, not the defects, if we can. And so this kind of system where you can do an ensemble measurement, but then single uh, particle measurement are, are important pieces to help to um, uh, sort out exactly those uh, interactions. These are the same components, but now organized with different symmetries. So the plasmonic resonance moves out in its position because the, um, the symmetry and positions, the coupling between the different gold resonators is changing as we change the crystal structure for the material. And so that's part of our, our thought again about designing metamaterials that allow tunable optical resonances um, by adjusting the interaction uh, between the systems. So, when we think about these systems, I showed you before a lot of work that dealt with different shapes of, uh, of nanocrystals as building blocks. And if we proceed in that theme, you can start to kind of move in a direction where we think about sort of fitting the pieces of a puzzle together. So I sometimes use the analogy that it's, it's sort of, it's a little bit like playing with Lego, except that this time when you, you take your bucket of Lego and you dump it out on the floor, it puts itself together, right? That's self-assembly. And the idea is that if you choose pieces that are complementary in their shapes, the minimum energy configuration is to allow the system to anneal and adjust so that it, it fits the puzzle pieces together or the Lego pieces together. This is an example of one of the, again, rare earth uh, um, uh, uh, matrices. So this is a, a system. At this time, it was not a dope system but the rare earth and plasmonic resonators for um, this kind of co-assembly. Um, the systems can get much more complicated as you start to put different geometries together, so rods and spheres and other um, systems that we talked about with, uh, with uh, the earlier geometries and the building blocks. They also can be co-assembled when the relative sizes and curvatures of these components are adjusted. Again, experimental work, it's pretty brutal to go through all the possible adjustments of the, of the geometry. But this is where um, uh, the opportunity to couple effectively to theory really helps. So again, with Sharon Glotzer and her team at the University of Michigan, what they were able to do was to take the, um, the structures that we provided and some of the points in terms of the phase space that, of, the, of what we had observed. And they were able to plot out um, uh, based on their simulation, some predictions of, 
of which of the parameters were important in getting a stable interaction. So in this particular case, it, it, one of the pieces that is most important is the curvature at the end of the rods. When the rods are, are the right shape at the end, they, can't, they pack very efficiently along the sidewalls and have a very strong um, entropic driving force. But at the ends, there's this extra free volume because the, the curved ends can't fit together efficiently. And so that leaves a little space for another material to be able to intercalate into the system. If the system is one where the uh, size ratios are, are too far out of, uh, out of the optimum, you get phase segregation. If the rods pack very nicely, but the, the uh, sphere particles are too small to uniquely occupy each of the interstices, you get a system that is sort of ordered in, the, uh, in one component and disordered or almost liquid-like in the other. And finally, when you get that lock and key matching where just one particle sits right in the, uh, in the void space between the ends of the rods, it locks into a crystal structure. But now it's one that captures two of the most ubiquitous sort of uh, geometries in nanoscale systems and rods and, and spheres. So you have a chance to think about that modular design aspect again in terms of uh, putting some of these uh, pieces together. The structures can get pretty um, complicated in terms of the organization. And I have to give credit to uh, uh, Taejong Paik, a, a former student of, of mine who's now a, a professor in Korea. So Taejong was brave enough to, he had been making some of these rarer systems with uh, lots of different uh, interesting geometries and sort of recognized that the, uh, the curvature in two of the families of the things that he was making was pretty closely matched. So here, the edges of this guy fit almost into, you know, when you look at it, again, in PowerPoint or on a, on a, on a whiteboard, um, this is a good experiment to try. To get the right experimental conditions for the co-assembly is a little bit harder. Um, but if you uh, do build these, then um, it will actually organize as uh, I was just illustrating. So here you can see a defect where the system's been pulled apart. And so these, order, these arrays sort of flop over so you can kind of see how they were sitting in the, in the structure. The x-ray is more conclusive in terms of the structure. But this is now um, the piece of the puzzle with a pretty complex shape. But they've self-organized so that they have complementary uh, components. And so that raises this possibility that you might be able to take two materials that have interesting properties that you can't normally combine, and by engineering their shape, they'll want to get together and to make a very specific crystal structure. And so this idea about um, multi-component assembly when combined with the ability to do really um, uh, precise engineering of, of the geometry is one of the things that we would put forward in this kind of uh, again, I talk about bonding in ke or the chemical analogy. It's bonding or valence. This is hybridization. So you've got the hybrid orbitals of one particle that present a certain symmetry. And you have a second structure which you've designed that is just the perfect acceptor. So where there's, there's a, a um, uh, ability to, it may be a little bit much to call this a bond between these guys. But in some ways, it is actually kind of either you could think of it as an entropic bond or maybe even enthalpy through the ligands. But if we define a bond as, a, as an energetically favorable, attractive interaction, it might actually meet those criteria. All right. So this idea about uh, designing further with different geometries can be uh, extended. Once you have control of the building blocks, then you can start to think about um, a much wider range of architecture. So um, in this particular case, it's combinations of rods and disks. And the motivation here is to try to see if you could get systems that actually were continuous and organized in, in orthogonal directions. So the disks are packing out of, out of plane, and the rods are standing uh, uh, orthogonal to the base of those uh, disks. And so the systems, here's a tilted example of, of the pieces. But So the rods are sticking out of plane, and then the disks are flat and stacking up uh, for this piece. And so you can design systems where adjusting the size of the various components either allows you to only get one uh, system, like uh, the previous, ex uh, oh, those are also two. OK, I'll show you the ones later. So here, two rods fit between each of these discoidal, sort of uh, uh, almost liquid crystalline type or uh, uh, assemblies of the disks. 
and the, um, the, the systems then allow you to uh, combine a combination of a quantum uh, 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 um, tunable system, the semiconductor nanorods, and the rare earth uh, uh, materials in this uh, particular design. So here's the single component system. You take slightly larger rods. Now two don't fit. Only one can get in between these guys. Or you adjust the system so that two rods can just fit to fill the available space. Or if you use really small rods, now you have that, that analogy to the earlier rod sphere example where the disks pack sort of in a crystalline array and the rods now have enough free volume that they're more like a liquid phase. They're kind of disordered all through the structure. But they're orientationally controlled. Right? All the rods are still pointing in the opposite direction to the, to the, um, uh, to the uh, disks in the system. And uh, let's be careful. OK, we want, time, we want questions. So uh, I would only, in, in mentioning the last uh, uh, piece here, I would just say that I, I think the richness in terms of the complexity of the organization, it, we really just kind of scratched the surface. So this is an example of a, a Rombi trihexagonal tiling. So that was sort of a mathematical construct from, I think, first in the 1700s. But this is the primitive unit cell of that system. So pretty complicated symmetry. And yet this is forming naturally from the self-organization of the materials just by taking two particles and making one of them not quite a sphere. So it's actually an octa, it's, it's got truncated corners, so it's more like an octa, uh, uh, it's got octahedral symmetry. And so with that two pieces, they can't quite fit together or don't choose to fit together to make a simple FCC or HCP structure. The best way that they can minimize the overall energy is to start looking for higher, uh, higher order symmetry. So it's a pretty complicated crystal structure, but it comes from very simple building blocks in terms of that design. But it's still crystalline. It does have a repeat uh, structure and well-defined translational vectors. All right. So um, if we go to that one, I'll, I will go back to the quasi-crystal part because I just like that piece. OK, let me go to one piece. Um, so if we take a system where we mix two components and they want to form super lattices but of incompatible symmetries. So one wants to be cubic and the other wants to be hexagonal. If you left them on their own, they would naturally go towards those two uh, systems. But if you choose a size ratio where you frustrate them, they basically don't know which way they want to go. So right at this point, there's a crossing in terms of the, the density so that the two structures are nearly identical. And then you have a curious competition. You could get uh, nucleation of separate phases if they're able to move far enough away from each other. But they also could solve the problem by trying to preserve local symmetry as they pack. And when that happens, you can get systems that form um, uh, quasi-crystals. So this is a dodecagonal, so 12-fold quasi-crystal. Let me blow it up a little bit. And so it's actually created by small groupings of the nanoparticles or nanocrystals. I use the term nanoparticle when it's not a single crystalline domain or as defects or other parts. Usually use the term nanocrystal for something that is, is a single uh, coherent crystal domain. But if you look closely at this, you'll see the packing motifs of hexagons and these sort of kite-shaped or, or uh, um, uh, diamond-like shapes. So this is the thought experiment of, of a, uh, what's called, often called a Penrose tiling. So this is the systems have symmetries that pack to give relatively high local density, but they don't give long-range translational order. Um, if I go, let me, yeah, so you can map on the symmetries for higher order in this piece. But um, what is interesting about these uh, systems and, uh, is that now the particles, usually in quasi-crystalline systems, it's very hard to visualize and precisely understand the atomic positions. Because of, uh, it, it's a wonderful experiment, people are understanding more of these aperiodic systems. But the, um, the advantage with the colloidal particles is they're large enough so that we can clearly um, identify the, the positions and the uh, local symmetry in, in these systems. And they bring up one kind of intriguing, let me see if I, yeah, OK. So they, they bring up a very intriguing possibility. 
and that is that this is a material that is, uh, has fundamentally two different um, sort of regimes of physics that it has to satisfy um, on different length scales. So at nanometer length scales and tens of nanometers, it's crystalline because the particles are crystalline and they have their extended physical properties. But on the uh, sort of uh, from tens to hundreds of nanometers, they're aperiodic. So excitations that are um, with natural length scales on the order of the size of the particles or particle pairs think that they, were, they live in a periodic world and should develop the, the physical properties associated with ordered matter. But any kind of excitation that is longer wavelength, phonons, magnons, any kind of uh, extended excitation, it thinks it lives in a world that is uh, aperiodic. And so we look at these systems as possibly a way to um, sort of have a, uh, an unusual, again, orthogonal, a decoupling of the physical parameters from different classes of, of, of phenomena. So thermal transport and other things should be governed largely by the uh, mean free path of phonons, which are much larger than, than the individual particles for long range transport of heat. But electronic transport in these systems should be dominated by some of the dynamics of, of, the, uh, of the small groupings of particles. If we ligand exchange them and couple them, then we start increasing the length scale that the electronic interactions feel. So at some point, if we are successful in increasing that delocalization, the carriers and the electronic properties should start to realize that they're not in, in, in a crystalline world as well. We haven't gotten that far in terms of understanding more about the transport properties in these systems. But this is an effort to try to sort of close the loop and, and think about you know, building blocks that allow us to make um, both ordered and organized systems that have um, elements of, of, of symmetry and architecture that mirror what we can do on, uh, in atomic systems. All right, so uh, let me just close with maybe that as the, as the last example, and then we can have a, a, few, a few minutes of questions or whatever you want. I'm, I'm at your service for, uh, for uh, the remainder. So, but if I go back, maybe I just want one, one piece. All right, no, that's too complicated. So back to one of these examples. So um, what we've tried to set out in, in the discussion, I tried to talk about, is sort of a progression. Artificial atoms that uh, basically take nanoscale uh, materials and their finite size effects as a way of tuning. It's almost like changing isotopes or changing the properties. And we establish that by getting size and shape control as well as the surface chemistry. And they have interesting properties on their own, but we asked the question, how much more interesting could it be if they talked to each other and started sharing information, electronic coupling? And so then we focused on developing these ideas about getting electronic delocalization, coupling of, of, of charge carriers in, in some of the other, well, only briefly mentioned, but spin coupling between systems. And we wanted to develop ways to then get the uh, incorporation of, of uh, doping and small uh, sort of uh, continuously tunable modifications of the properties. But we need the next step, which is we want to be able to take classes of properties from one area of, of phenomena, magnets and semiconductors, and put them together. Or to take um, uh, optical resonators like the plasmonic systems, rare earth emitters, quantum dots, and so on. We wanted to make it a modular design process. And so we're kind of working our way on that path so that we have strategies that allow us to put things together and then turn on the uh, interaction at nanometer dimensions so that you start to get quantum mechanical coupling between the components. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions, comments, or you know, uh, also anything that comes up through the rest of the conference, I'm uh, also happy to, to follow up on. So thank you very much. <laughs>